Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. A weak jobs report for September. We break down the difference between the private and public sectors. Meanwhile, President Biden says recovery is moving forward, touting a drop in the unemployment rate. His final months in office, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio phasing out the gifted and talented exam for four-year-olds. It'll be replaced by an accelerated program available to all kindergartners. The transgender sports bill in Texas is one step closer to becoming law. It would require students to compete in sports based on their biological sex at birth. A number of states have passed similar bills this year. A county sheriff in Southern California says he will not force his employees to get vaccinated to keep their jobs. He believes lawmakers have politicized vaccine mandates. And te Tesla is moving its headquarters out of California, partly due to high property costs and long commutes, not to mention Texas's low tax rate. The September jobs report is out. On the surface, it shows a lukewarm recovery. The private sector managed to hire a decent number of workers, but 100,000 government jobs were lost, and that brought the total down. NTD's Kevin Hogan has the update. U.S. employers added just under 200,000 jobs in September. The private sector added 317,000 jobs, while the number of government jobs dropped by 123,000. Though the economy is growing, it's doing so at the slowest pace this year. Industries from leisure to retail and manufacturing are all adding jobs, with wages rising too. But the mediocre jobs report suggests the Delta variant and a shortage of workers are still presenting a challenge. The unemployment rate fell about a half a point from the previous month, and that's what President Biden chose to highlight in this lower-than-expected jobs report. Today's report has the unemployment rate down to 4.8 percent a significant improvement from when I took office and a sign that our recovery is moving forward, even in the face of a COVID pandemic. A phenomenon has emerged throughout the pandemic. Workers have taken a closer look at their career path and started looking at opportunities to work remotely and finding more about employee benefits and their long-term future. It's known as the great reevaluation. The great reevaluation, as we put it, is, is certainly underway with, with candidates just looking at different opportunities. They're becoming a little bit more picky about what they apply for. They're becoming a bit more selective about the companies that they apply to. And they're being more um, objective about the things that are important to them on a, on a skill level, not just a, a job level. But supply chain bottlenecks have only become worse. This has caused factory production to slow and left store shelves empty. Not to mention bringing inflation to its highest point in 30 years. And that hurts consumers and ultimately is a challenge for business. And so when we see inflation adjusted wages uh, or, or wages adjusted for inflation on the decline in recent months, that means that consumers have less buying power and that weighs on the recovery. Yet a lot of experts are predicting good things as the virus wanes and more people start traveling and eating out. They say at that point there will be more people looking for jobs and hiring will pick up. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. The risk of an economic recession is kicked down the road, but the political infighting will probably bubble up again in December. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer gave a fiery speech that frustrated a number of senators, some calling it unnecessary partisan talk about a serious issue that remains unresolved. NTD's Melina Weiskopf reports. Now, after the Senate last night passed this deal to temporarily raise the debt ceiling until December, Senator, uh, Senate Democrat leader Chuck Schumer went on the floor and gave a victory speech in a sense. But what he said and the tone that he said it in seemed to have put off a couple of senators, both Republican and even Senator Manchin in the Democratic Party. They, they addressed him on the floor after his speech and just told him they don't feel like this is the time for such a message. Republicans played a dangerous and risky partisan game, but said Democrats must raise it alone by going through a drawn-out, convoluted, and risky reconciliation process. That was simply unacceptable to my caucus. And yesterday, Senate Republicans finally realized that their obstruction was not going to work. 
Around three senators, including Senator Manchin, spoke to Schumer after the speech. Senator Thune called it an incredibly partisan speech that was totally out of line. And he's one of the 11 Republicans who joined Democrats in overcoming the 60-vote threshold in order to pass the temporary solution. But the majority of Republicans were opposed to McConnell's deal with Schumer. Democratic Senator Joe Manchin told reporters his colleagues should, quote, de-weaponize. I understand that it's for best for both sides. You can fight about a lot of things, mm -hmm. but you don't throw this out. This is the most serious thing we can do. The same political infighting is expected to bubble up again in December. While the debt ceiling situation is stable for now, the economy is holding up on fragile ground. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. New York City is planning to end its gifted and talented program for students. Critics say the test to get into the program discriminates against black and Latino applicants. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is phasing out the gifted and talented program for students. The program will be replaced by accelerated learning made available for all students. Alina Adams, who is the founder of NYC School Secrets and a mother of three, said the change caught her by surprise. Last year, parents were promised that they would get updates about the new gifted and talented program. They were told there would be meetings, there would be parent engagement, and we would find out something in the fall. As it turned out, there were absolutely no meetings. There was no parent engagement. There was no asking parents what they wanted in a program. There was just, as of today, a blanket statement. G&T as we know it is over. According to the New York City Department of Education, the majority of the students who were admitted into the Gifted and Talented program were Asian American or white. Critics say the test to get into the Gifted and Talented program is discriminatory against black and Latino students. Adam says a test can't be racist, but it can show more about the student's home environment. It can assess what kids have had access to. Have they had access to a good early learning program? Have they had access to a home where there's a lot of vocabulary? She says the bottom line is that parents just want the best for their children, whether they're the smartest in their class or not. The majority of people do not think their children are gifted. Here's what they do think. They see what's offered in a basic general ed curriculum and they find it absolutely unsatisfactory. With a G&T classroom, you might get a little bit more than what you get in a gen ed classroom and that's what all those parents want. Students who are currently in the gifted and talented program will be able to continue their elementary education in that program. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. A bill in Texas would bar transgender athletes from competing in girls' sports. A House committee has approved the bill this week, and the full House will be taking it up next. NTD spoke with a female athlete and a school board trustee in Texas to get their views on the bill's importance. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. Texas House Bill 25 would require that student athletes in public schools and colleges compete in sports based on their biological sex at birth. College freshman Cassidy Corner has been playing basketball since she was 11, and she got into college thanks to a basketball scholarship. She tells NTD the bill is important to her. I just, for all the women athletes that are out there that are working as hard, that are putting in all the work, it's heartbreaking to think that they are at risk and their scholarships and their playing spots are at risk because a man could come in and say he identifies as a woman and just swoop in and take their spot. Corner's mother says their family didn't have enough funds to send Corner to college. Had it not been for the basketball scholarship, Corner would not have gotten into her current school. So she doesn't want women to have to compete with biological men for sports scholarships. She's concerned that more transgender athletes will compete in the future. And once one school starts recruiting biological men to play on their team, the other teams are going to have to because it's about winning, you know, you need to win or you want to win. And so if one team has the advantage, you're trying to get that edge too. And it just turns into a domino effect. Track athlete Selena Soul from Connecticut has filed a lawsuit against the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference for allowing biological men to compete in girls' sports. She describes what it was like when she had to compete with transgender athletes in high school track. The first race that I competed against a transgender athlete was during my freshman year. 
and once the gun went off, the two transgender athletes took off flying and left all of us girls in the dust. I knew right then and there that some girls would be missing out on great opportunities to succeed. And a trustee from the Alvin Independent School District Board in Texas tells NTD what the parents in our district are most concerned about. It was always a concern of a boy participating against a girl, competing against a girl for the girl's safety because boys are stronger, faster, you know, they, they just, there is so much more a risk for injury for the female athlete if she is having to compete against a boy in the same sport. She says several parents of female athletes have talked with her about the issue. They are very concerned about their daughter's mental health. So they already see the mental health stress and the physical stress on their daughters just having to compete against other girls. They are greatly concerned if their daughters have to start competing against guys. The bill has passed the committee stage and the full House will be looking at it soon. It's likely to pass because over half of the House members have co-authored similar bills in the past. Allison Lee, NTD News. Parents rallied outside their local school board meeting in Fairfax County, Virginia last night. They were sending a message that they won't be intimidated by the Justice Department or FBI following the DOJ's recent directive. We hear more on this issue from the Vice President of Parents Defending Education. NTD's Grace Coulter has the details. We the parents! We the parents! We the parents! Parents here in Fairfax County, Virginia, have a message for the DOJ and their local school board. Are you guys afraid of standing up for your kids? Never. Never. They rallied Thursday night outside their county school board meeting. The rally is in response to Attorney General Merrick Garland's directive to the FBI and other law enforcement to investigate an alleged spike in threats of violence towards school board members. Garland's directive came after the National School Boards Association asked the Biden administration for help against threats. But numerous parents view the move by the association and the DOJ as a scare tactic to stop parents from pushing back against certain policies and curricula. Nationwide, parents are paying attention. They're asking the school board serious questions about how money is spent, the ideology that's being promoted in the classroom. And these school board members don't like getting these hard questions. Asra Nomani, the vice president for strategy and investigations at Parents Defending Education, was at the rally and behind the camera. Speaking with NTD's The Nation Speaks, Nomani accused the National School Boards Association of launching a character assassination on parents. The association said in its letter to the president that the acts of malice, violence and threats against public school officials could be classed as the equivalent to a form of domestic terrorism and hate crimes. But Nomani said she looked carefully through the footnotes and said none of the reference incidents were acts of violence. She says that although parents won't back down, they're concerned about what could be labeled as a threat or harassment. So they are asking us really important questions like, you know, what does it mean to be, quote, threatening, as is now been criminalized, you know, in the language of the school board association? Is it just speaking loudly? Is it calling them out? And we're giving the advice that, you know, all good debaters have, which is debate the ideas that exist that are bad ideas that you're challenging. Don't make it personal. She said Parents Defending Education also recommends parents videotape all proceedings at school board meetings and reminds parents that they too are being videotaped. And they're waiting to catch you in a quote, angry parent moment. And so model, you know, the kind of engagement that you want everybody to see. She has another piece of advice for parents. Be unapologetic, you know, in your defense of children because we are their strongest advocates. You know, these poor kids are minors in society and don't have the kind of voice that we have, and they should not be held hostage by activists who are trying to intimidate their biggest defenders, the parents. The DOJ is expected to launch further efforts to address the alleged rise in criminal conduct directed towards school personnel in the coming weeks, including the creation of a task force. Grace Coulter, NTD News. 
You can watch the full interview with Azra Nomani on The Nation Speaks at 11 a.m. Eastern on Saturday. And a congressional candidate from New Jersey has taken issue with vaccine passports. He says black Americans are especially restricted by them and that they should be allowed to be skeptical of the vaccine. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. You want to demonize everyone who refuses the COVID-19 vaccine. Billy Prempe posted this video on Twitter in defense of the black community's low vaccination rate. White liberals seem to think that they know what's best for us. The truth is, black Americans have authority over our own bodies, not you. We're tired of being controlled, manipulated, and lied to. The, the Republican congressional candidate laid out a series of events, like the Tuskegee experiment, that he says made black Americans skeptical of the government. He says this is why America's black population has a low vaccination rate. And in turn, the low rate is why mandates, like the citywide one in New York City, restrict them the most. Prempe says unvaccinated people are being bullied. So from what I've noticed, the, the main people that are going around bullying and basically demeaning and insulting people regarding uh, the vaccines are the white liberals. If, I, if I'm on social media or I'm out in public and someone asks, hey, have you been vaccinated? Did you take the vaccine? They get real skittish and they start to get very condescending, um, telling people like myself that, oh, you should go and get the vaccine because the government says so, essentially. Others have raised similar issues. Founder of the American King Foundation, Angela Stanton King, has called vaccine mandates a medical segregation. But officials and others who advocate for these policies say this is about making it through the pandemic, not about race. New York City's Mayor Bill de Blasio's had to defend his mandate in court. In a court filing obtained by Bloomberg, the city said the purpose of the mandate has clearly been stated to encourage all city residents, regardless of race, to get vaccinated. Prempe says he believes vaccines and vaccine mandates will be extremely important issues to Americans in next year's primary elections. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. A county sheriff in Southern California says he will not force his employees to receive a vaccine if they choose not to. He believes vaccine mandates have become too politicized. NTD's Cynthia Kai has more. Speaking during a weekly live Facebook Q&A on October 7th, Los Angeles County Sheriff Alex Villanueva said he encourages but will not force his employees to get vaccinated after the city approved one of the strictest COVID-19 vaccine mandates in the country. Uh, as I said, no, I'm not forcing anyone. The, the issue has become so politicized, there are entire groups of employees that are willing to be fired and laid off rather than get vaccinated. So I don't want to be in a position to lose five, ten percent of my workforce overnight on a Mac vaccine mandate. Via Nueva said the new mandate puts him in a difficult position where he faces losing more employees. He said the police force already struggles with bare bone staffing issues due to decreased funding. I have deputies, I have sergeants work in multiple shifts week after week, month after month. I have sergeants work in nine nine shifts on top of their normal shifts a month. During the Facebook live stream, he asked city officials to stop politicizing public safety. The City of Los Angeles City Council voted to approve the new vaccine mandate on October 6th. The new mandate will require anyone aged 12 and older to provide proof of vaccination to enter indoor venues, such as restaurants, gyms, theaters, salons, indoor government facilities, shopping centers, and more. Exceptions will be available for individuals with valid medical exemptions and for those with sincerely held religious belief. Individual businesses and locations will review exception requests. People with approved exemptions will need to show a negative COVID-19 test within 72 hours. The mandate will become effective as of November 4th, but does not apply to pharmacies and grocery stores. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. The ruptured pipeline that spilled gallons of oil into the ocean in Southern California may have been caused by a ship snagging the pipeline. Experts believe it left a narrow gash that was difficult to detect. Video of the ruptured pipeline that spilled tens of thousands of gallons of crude oil off Southern California shows a thin crack along the top of the pipe. Experts said it could indicate a slow leak that initially was difficult to detect. The 13-inch long narrow gash could explain why signs of an oil slick were seen Friday night. 
but Amplify Energy, a Houston-based company that owns and operates the oil platforms, said it didn't know there had been a spill until its workers detected an oil sheen on the water Saturday morning. Together with five agencies, federal and state agencies, we have assessed and verified pipeline data and made a determination that the minimum amount of crude oil released from that pipeline is 588 barrels of oil. The Coast Guard estimates the spill to be between 25,000 gallons to 132,000 gallons. Investigators are looking into whether a ship waiting to offload its cargo snagged and bent the pipeline with its anchor. You know, they'll have to probably cut the pipeline section out that's failed and, uh, uh, and then do forensic analysis on it to ascertain, um, you know, when this release occurred and what the most likely cause would have been. Right now, thinking is uh, that a ship anchor apparently dragged this pipe over 100 feet. A container ship, Rotterdam Express, was suspected to be involved with the spill since the ship was anchored closest to the pipeline last week. But after the Coast Guard interviewed the captain and crew and checked their logbook, the Rotterdam was clear to go. Questions remain about when the oil company knew it had a problem and delays in reporting the spill. Nobody wants this to happen, but the primary focus right now has obviously been focused on trying to, you know, contain and restrict where the oil is going and trying to get as much as you can cleaned up. But the history of um, oil spill responses, they don't recover many of the barrels that are actually released. Investigators are looking into the incident with other agencies as a major marine casualty, with damages exceeding $500,000. They will determine if criminal charges, civil penalties, or laws or regulations are needed. Tesla is moving its headquarters out of California to Austin, Texas. Elon Musk says it'll be easier to scale its operations from there. NTD's Faye Quarter has the details. And then... Uh... I'm excited to announce that we're moving our headquarters to Austin, Texas. It's official. Elon Musk announced Thursday that Tesla is moving its headquarters from Palo Alto, California to Austin, Texas. It's, it, it, it's, it's tough for people to afford houses and a lot of people have to come in from far away. And so it's, uh, we'll, we'll take, you're taking it as far as, as possible, but it's, um, there's a limit to how, how big you can scale in, in the Bay Area. So Realtor.com says the median home price in Palo Alto is $3.3 million, while the median home price in Austin is $588,000. This could also be a potentially personal issue for Elon Musk. He stands to save approximately $2.5 billion by moving from California to Texas. Nicholas Creel is an assistant professor of business law at Georgia College. He says California has a capital gains tax that treats income from stock options as any other income. Creel says another consideration is SpaceX. SpaceX. He is already located in Boca Chica, Texas, trying to get that off the ground, literally and figuratively. And so being a little bit closer and more accessible to that new company is definitely something that's gonna drive this. Meanwhile, California's income tax rate can be as high as 12.3% for those in the top bracket, and the corporate income tax rate is a flat 8.84%. Meanwhile, Texas has no income taxes. In CNBC's list of America's top states for business 2021, Texas is ranked as the fourth best state, while California is ranked 33rd. Um, just to, to be clear, though, we will be continuing to expand our activities in California. So this is not a matter of, of sort of Tesla leaving California. Um, as I said, we're, we're, our, our intention is to actually increase output uh, from Fremont and from uh, Giga Nevada by 50 percent. Musk says their Texas factory is five minutes from the airport and 15 minutes from downtown. He also cited commute times as a reason for the shift. Bay Quarter, NTD News. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks for being here. The Biden administration is looking to develop a new security accord with Mexico. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Mexico City today meeting with the Mexican president. Under this new framework, the new two countries will invest in public health to reduce drug use and dismantle criminal networks. The two countries said in a joint statement today that they will also work to dismantle firearm trafficking from the U.S. to Mexico. They say this new framework will be more holistic than the one before. They're calling it the U.S.-Mexico Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health and Safe Communities. 
The current framework, called the Merida Initiative, has been in place for 13 years. And last month, New York Governor Kathy Hochul extended the state's eviction moratorium, preventing landlords from removing tenants who don't pay rent. To help compensate the landlords for their financial losses, Hochul on Thursday announced an additional $125 million in rent relief for landlords who couldn't qualify for the state's emergency rental assistance program. Here's NTD's Chenny Wu with more. Many landlords were previously ineligible for the New York State Emergency Rental Assistance, or ERAP, because a federal rule required tenants to participate in the application process, which many did not. The new program, called the Landlord Rental Assistance Program, provides those landlords with up to 12 months of past due rent. Governor Hochul said in a statement, I am proud that our state's rental assistance program has already provided much-needed relief to tens of thousands of New Yorkers. But there are still many small landlords ineligible for that relief because of federal rules who also need our help. Hochul says she's optimistic that this additional funding will help New Yorkers recover financially from the pandemic. It's really important to understand that just because you're a landlord doesn't mean, you know, you're necessarily a multi multi-millionaire. There are landlords that are maybe renting out, you know, a few units or they even live in the building where they're renting out and that is their income. Lauren Hurwitz is a licensed real estate agent based in upstate New York. She says although the program may not be able to recover all losses, it will provide landlords with some much-needed support. Landlords that I've spoken to are very grateful to be getting something because, again, something is really better than nothing at all. But, of course, they wish there was room for more funds to be coming into them. What's more, Hoko also requested more ERAP funding from the U.S. Treasury Department, citing its shrinking balance. So far, the program has approved more than 63,000 direct payments to landlords, adding up to $804 million in assistance. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition, New York is now a leading state in obligated funding and direct payments. Chenny Wu, NTD News, New York. Coming up, New York City is back with its biggest parade since the start of the pandemic, the Columbus Day Parade. Even the mayor will attend, even though he removed the name from school calendars. And a major holiday item may be in short supply this year. You might want to get yours early. Find out more here on NTD News. I will bless those who bless you. Here in Israel and the former Soviet Union, the Jewish people are living in very difficult times. There are now thousands of destitute elderly Jews who are desperately in need of basic food. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is on the ground with survival food boxes, but the need for food is growing. Call or go online now and say, I will bless these children of Abraham. It's the elderly widows who are hurting the most. Many of them are also Holocaust survivors who are once again crying out for help. Their need, as you can see, is extremely urgent. Right now, you can give a gift of life of $25 that will help rush an emergency food box to an elderly Jewish person who doesn't have enough to eat. When you call right now, your gift's impact will be doubled to help save lives. For over 35 years, this trusted ministry has given Christians like me a way to tangibly bless Jewish people who are in need throughout the world. Wherever in the world the Jewish people have the greatest need, our spiritual mandate is to feed the hungry and to care for the widows and orphans. Together, we bring them comfort and love, but just as important, we bring them this life-saving food box. When you call right now, your gift's impact will be doubled to help save lives. Without your response, their pain and suffering will continue. Call or go online now and say, I will save a life. I will bless and comfort the Jewish people.
Columbus Day is coming up and New York City is ready. The parade is going to be the biggest one since the start of the pandemic. NTD's Arian Pazdar was at the organizer's grand announcement. If you're off work next Monday, you might want to go see a Columbus Day parade. They're usually fun, they're exciting and they have great food. Now the organizers of New York City's parade came to this Italian restaurant here to tell us what their parade is going to look like. Italian Americans are going to be out there on Monday. We're going to celebrate our heritage and culture, but we're going to celebrate, more importantly, New York City coming back and being alive and well again. The parade will start at 11.30 on Monday. It's going to be held in Uptown Manhattan on Fifth Avenue, and there will be no COVID restrictions for visitors. Joe Piscopo, who used to host Saturday Night Live, is advocating for the event and will be there as well. We're so proud of our Italian-American heritage. You always think of my grandparents coming over, coming to America, learning the language, learning the laws of the greatest country. Not only the organizers, but also New Yorkers seem to be excited about the event and about the city coming back to life. Oh, I'm always excited for it. Every, every single Columbus Day when it comes through, especially in New York City. One of the best times you could have here in New York City on Columbus Day. New York City's mayor, who is of Italian descent himself, renamed Columbus Day to Indigenous People's Day in school calendars earlier this year. But nonetheless, the mayor will still participate in Monday's parade. Three months before I got there. President Biden issued the first ever presidential proclamation of Indigenous People's Day on Friday. The day will be observed on October 11th, along with Columbus Day. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. And also on Columbus Day, Boston will finally hold its marathon after a six-month delay. But it's going to be a lot smaller than usual due to pandemic restrictions. About the only thing this year that's the same as every other year is the course, the road the runners will come down. Everything else is different. Thousands of masked runners gathered on Friday to pick up their race bib numbers. This as a construction crew continued last minute with preparations for the world's longest continually running marathon. The number of participants was reduced from over 30,000 to 20,000 and runners won't be able to gather in large groups. The start process will also be different. Instead of gathering at the starting line, runners will get off a bus and immediately take off. And if you're thinking about buying a Christmas tree this year, you might want to start looking for it right now. It looks like there will be a shortage of trees this holiday season. NTD's Phil Zoe has more. Fake trees or real trees, it doesn't matter. We're running low on tree supply. Better get your Christmas trees early this year, and we're only in October. When you see what you want, please buy it, buy it early, so that way you don't have to worry about the headaches as you get closer to the holidays, where you might go out to your stores or shop online and find that stock is not available. The American Christmas Tree Association says the shortage is industry-wide because of extreme weather and supply chain problems. You want to take advantage of every opportunity you have to get a tree, so you should really just get this early as you can. But I'm chill. If I can't get something, I'm just going to hang in there and wait until it's available. NTD News visited a local flower shop in New York that's selling Christmas trees right now in October. Uh, they have a lot of plants. I mean, they have fake ones, they have real ones. Well, no, but can... people buy all year long. You know, sometimes people buy all year long. Caroline Tuan at artificial Christmas tree firm Balsam Brands hopes all families can get the tree that they wish for. We, as well as many of the companies that you'll want to buy Christmas gifts from, will be delivering joy without a lot of heartache if you order early. Phil Zhou, NTD News. And a baby in New York City was about to die before police officers saved its life. The NYPD published footage of the incident. The lady handed the baby to an officer who carried it into a police car. From there, the officers rushed to the hospital while one of, the, one of them performed CPR. Once they arrived, the officer didn't lose a second and ran into the building with the baby in his arms. He laid it onto a hospital bed, and from there, doctors took over and managed to save the baby's life. And coming up, Chinese authorities discharged reservoir water without sufficient warning. 
The resulting flood swept away a 66-year-old resident and he's still missing. And Hungary's Prime Minister is blaming the European Union's climate initiatives for the surge in energy prices. He wants the bloc to reverse some carbon policies. That and more in just a moment here on NTD News. The continued downpour in China's Shangxi province is forcing authorities to release water from reservoirs. But they're doing it without sufficient warning. And as a result, tragically, in one village, an elderly man was swept away. We spoke with his son to understand what happened. NTD's Don Ma has more. Heavy rain in northern China's Sanxi province is causing reservoirs to overflow. And in one village, local authorities discharged reservoir water, which swept away an elderly man. He was yet to be found as of Thursday. We interviewed the man's son to find out what happened. We used a voice actor and gave him a pseudonym to protect his identity. The reservoir from upstream released water, but before they started releasing it, we didn't get any notification. They said they sent a text message to a group chat, but the elderly people in the village don't even use smartphones, so they didn't know about the water release at all. He says that the village authorities did announce by loudspeaker that they would discharge water from a reservoir October 1st to the 4th. But on the 5th, authorities were still releasing water. And without further warning, they suddenly increased the volume of water released. That was the day Mr. Lee's father was washed away. He was 66 years old. I don't know what time it was in the afternoon. The upstream reservoir suddenly raised all its floodgates and released water. But my father didn't know anything about it. In the afternoon, he rode his electric bicycle home as usual. As he was crossing a bridge, the water swept him away. The bridge even collapsed from the force of the water. At about 7.30 that night, we heard that my father had been in an accident. After hearing the news, he rushed to the scene. We rushed over and found him standing on his electric bicycle holding onto a tree. Rescuers also arrived. They got about four or five meters from my father. They tried rescuing him twice and couldn't do it. When they tried getting close to him to save him the third time, they found that he was no longer there. He was gone. Mr. Lee says that they were searching for him on Thursday. They found his bicycle but didn't find his father. He says flood water was released again suddenly and they were forced to stop searching. Lee says local authorities have not done enough to deal with the floods. He says they failed to ensure that everyone knew about the discharge and suggest that they could have arranged personnel to be on duty in the village. Don Ma, NTD News. And also in China, thousands gathered in protest over the unexpected death of a worker. The man reportedly went to collect his wages, but returned severely burned. Local authorities dispatched their police force to suppress the uprising. Here are the details. Thousands of Chinese migrant workers are protesting for a fellow worker who died. Wang Xi lost his life trying to recover wages he was owed. The tragedy began last Sunday in a city in the southeast province of Zhejiang where he worked. Online Chinese media says Wang's boss had delayed his wage of $2,800. But when he tried to ask for it, he was severely burned all over. That's according to a tweet of someone who says he's Wang's brother. He says Wang couldn't afford medical treatment and died two days later. Online Chinese media say local authorities released no details of the death. Now thousands of migrant workers from Wang's hometown are protesting in front of the local town hall. Numerous specialized police officers appeared on the scene. They stand together to separate the protesters. This issue triggered heated discussion online. A comment says, do you know what's the most powerful thing about the Chinese Communist Party? It's the best in the world at controlling people. Another says the delayed wages aren't worth much. They would rather spend a hundred times, a thousand times more in controlling people than compromise. Most migrant workers in China live a miserable life due to discrimination from communist regime policies. Most of them have a hukou in villages and go to the cities for work. Hukou is like a passport inside China. People are registered with a hukou at birth, which basically says you're from that area. If you move to another place later, you won't have access to the social benefits there. This is especially relevant for these migrant workers. Since most of them got their hukou from the villages, they have very limited access to city residents' benefits, such as education and health care. 
As a result, many of their children have to stay behind in the villages, and they suffer long periods of separation from their parents. According to statistics from China's Labor Bulletin, one-third of total Chinese laborers are migrant workers. For the past three decades, migrant workers have been recognized as the engine of China's rapid economic growth. But due to Beijing's policies, they are also marginalized. And stories like Wang Qi's are not a one-off in China. The Prime Minister of Hungary in Eastern Europe is blaming the EU's climate initiatives for the surge in prices. And now he's asking European officials to reverse some carbon policies. NTD's Patrick Hayden in London has the story. Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban on Friday said the European Union's climate change policy contributes to the surge in energy prices. He says that Hungary and Poland would be united on this issue at the next EU summit. Soaring costs of permits on the EU carbon market have contributed around a fifth of the power price increase. Orban spoke on State Radio Friday saying bureaucrats in Brussels are fighting climate change by continuously raising the price of coal and gas. His government in 2010 put a cap on power hikes for households. In effect, prices have been frozen since then for consumers, but businesses have had to deal with the increasing costs. Auburn is calling for the EU to suspend its emissions trading system. He also says they have to return to reality. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. This year's Nobel Peace Prize is awarded to two journalists for their courage to defend freedom of expression. In their home countries of the Philippines and Russia, they face threats, arrest and even murder. NTD's Joanne Robson has more on this. The Norwegian Nobel Committee awards this year's Nobel Peace Prize to two journalists, Maria Ressa from the Philippines and Dmitry Muratov from Russia. Ms. Ressa and Mr. Muratov are receiving the Peace Prize for their courageous fight for freedom of expression in the Philippines and in Russia. At the same time, they are representatives of all journalists who stand up for this ideal in a world in which democracy and freedom of the press face increasingly adverse conditions. Maria Ressa co-founded Rapala, a news website criticizing President Duterte's controversial anti-drug campaign. The committee says she documents how social media is being used to spread fake news, harass opponents and manipulate public discourse. Ressa says journalism has never been as important as it is today. Rappler lives with the possibility of a shutdown on a daily basis. We're on quicksand. And yet at the same time, if you keep the North Star ahead of you, you know, you protect the facts. You hold power to account. Dmitry Muratov co-founded newspaper Novaja Gazeta and has been editor-in-chief for 24 years. The committee says he defended freedom of speech in Russia for decades under increasingly challenging conditions. Muratov talks of colleague Anna Politkovskaya, one of six Novaja Gazeta journalists who have been killed. For 15 years they could not solve the murder. It probably means that they know but don't want to tell. This is how the impunity has affected our guild. Reza and Moratov were chosen out of over 300 candidates. The two winners will share £840,000. Juwan Robson, NTD News. A Saudi wealth fund now owns the soccer club Newcastle United. Newcastle is the latest sports asset to be acquired by wealthy Saudis, while human rights groups question the motive behind the purchases. The English Premier League's Newcastle United has been acquired by Saudi Arabia's multi-billion dollar sovereign wealth fund. Fans welcomed the announcement on Thursday outside the club's home stadium, St. James Park. The long-running takeover saga brought an end to owner Mike Ashley's deeply unpopular reign over what most saw as a lack of investment in Newcastle. The deal was said to be worth £305 million, or about $415 million. Now owned by the Saudi-led consortium, Newcastle will become one of the world's richest clubs. Saudi Arabia has increasingly sought high-profile sports assets, venturing into Formula One racing and heavyweight boxing. Human rights groups, however, have remained wary, condemning what they call Riyadh's efforts to distract from its human rights record. 
Saudi Arabia's government has denied allegations of human rights abuses, saying it is protecting national security from extremists. Coming up, math and art intermix at a museum in Paris. The exhibition features pearls designed and positioned according to a mathematical theory to reflect light in a 3D space. That and more in just a moment here on NTD News. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. Makers of high-performance electric cars have long been looking for ways to develop lighter, more powerful batteries. This prompted an Oxford-based company to work on motors that are lightweight and more efficient. Here's NTD's Eddie Aitken with more. Speed has always been paramount for supercar makers and now they are in the race of their lives to electrify the highest performance vehicles before climate policy cuts their combustion engines. That's why Ferrari and Mercedes-Benz are turning to startups such as Oxford-based electric motor company Yasa for expertise and technology. So what Yasa's technology enables is for uh, vehicle manufacturers to get a longer driving range. So you can drive your car further on a single battery charge with our motor about 10% further than you could with a conventional motor that's in all other vehicles today. Batteries are immensely heavy and electric motors overheat if driven too hard. These are big problems for a niche industry that charges hundreds of thousands for lightweight cars capable of screaming round a track. Today's battery technology cannot compete with the sustained power of a petrol engine. So Yasa are rethinking everything from electric motors to car body materials. So typically almost all electric cars that are on the market today use a, a type of electric motor called a radial motor that is sausage shaped uh, and it actually it is bigger, it's about three times the size of Yasa's technology and three times the weight of our technology as well and also has about a 10% less efficiency from that motor. Yasa already makes motors for Ferrari, Swedish supercar maker Koenigsegg and an unnamed British supercar company. At a small facility in Oxford, it also tests motors for AMG, the high-performance subsidiary of Mercedes-Benz. Yeah, so I think uh, at this point in time, uh, with Ferrari, we've reached a certain level that is probably two, two to three times better than the competition. And we still have a long way to go in our technology roadmap, not just with the motors, but also with the power electronics that we can integrate in them. Makers of high-end electric cars keep racing to develop lighter, more powerful batteries. Hedy Aitken, NTD News. And in Paris, a museum puts on a unique exhibition featuring colorful pearl sculptures inspired by mathematics. NTD's David Vivas has more. Metal and glass pearls in the form of lotuses and necklaces, as well as colorful bricks. These are the creation of the French artist Jean-Michel Autonial. Petit Palais in Paris hosted the artist's new exhibition, A Radiant and Shiny World of Wonder. Autonial takes us all through the rooms in Petit Palais, as if we're walking in a wonderland. Over here, a blue river made of glass bricks, a calm, still water reflecting the wild knots above. The pearls are made of glass and steel with the ability to reflect their surroundings. 
These forms are not just from the artist's imagination. These are so-called wild knots inspired by mathematic figures. The mathematical theory of the knots revealed the existence of more than a million possible knots, some of which are called wild knots and have an infinite degree of complexity. These wild knots have been created in collaboration with Mexican mathematician Albin Arroyo, who studies reflection theory. As a reference to this theory, Otoniel named the exhibition the Narcissus Theorem. Narcissus is a man in Greek mythology who died looking at his own reflection and turned into a flower. The 74 art pieces are spread throughout the museum and its garden, with some in surprising locations, like this 1,100-pound crown made of Italian glass and this golden lotus sitting in the middle of the garden pound. The Petit Palais Museum was established at the beginning of the 20th century, featuring a blend of traditional and modern architecture. Sanjay says this new exhibition brings hope and joy as the city returns to normal after months of lockdown. David Vives, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Before you go, here's something you should know. Don't forget you can catch all of NTD's programs on television. NTD Business premieres live Mondays through Fridays at 5 p.m. We broadcast to many of your favorite platforms, Apple TV and Roku, for example. We're also rapidly growing on cable, satellite and over the air all across the United States. Just go to ntd.com TV, type in your zip code and find all the ways you can watch NTD.